anyway, uh, he wrote his PhD. Uh, so he's got an academic sort of profile. He's written a number of books, been very involved in the Leaves Carnival and so on. Uh, but alongside his academic interests, Max has always been a political activist. Uh, not necessarily in the narrow party political way, but he's worked for decades in sort of Chapel Town, taking up the cause of, in fact, the residents of Chapel Town and also, in fact, other sort of uh, uh, contentious matters in Leeds. The third string to his bow, which perhaps some of you don't know, is that he is actually a brilliant photographer. And if you ever go to various events, you'll see him crouching down, taking his pictures. Remind me of this guy. <laughs> so, uh, it, a, a man of many talents, and he's here this afternoon to talk to us about the book that he's just written, celebrating the life of our France. And this is Arthur. Uh, and what I'll do is I will leave Max to talk about Arthur because he obviously is a great friend of his and knows him much better than I do. So over to you, Max. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks to Arthur for being here. We're going to the way we're going to, to do this is I'm going to show a few slides, some of which are my own photos and some of which are from other sources, which are sort of one very brief summary of Arthur's <laughs> contributions really in this city. I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on, on the work he's done in this city, but he, he is actually um, a man of kind of global significance. He's very well known in the Caribbean. He's very well known in, in, in power and black political activism all over Europe and elsewhere. So it, we're, we're really privileged to have this gentleman with us. And I'm very privileged to have been asked by him to write this book, which um, I, I, I would love you historians and intellectuals to give me an honest appraisal of it because it's quite a tricky thing, writing a book about somebody who you totally admire, and it might be stretching this, it's a slightly romantic thing to say, but I have a kind of love for this man because he is such a, a warm and vibrant figure and has been so crucial in my own development, actually. A lot of what I know I've learned from Arthur and, and being in his company and, 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 and being a supporter of the move for the political actions that I'm going to, one or two of which I'm going to uh, talk about now. So it's a great privilege of me, for me to have been asked to write this book, but it was tricky to do because as, I, as Janet kindly said, you know, I did have for a while a bit of an academic profile and I know how, um, well, you know, one of the mantras we all used to give to our students, and I know lots of you here have had students as well, always be critical, always, you know, see what's gone wrong here, always treat the material with a critical eye. And that is something that I completely um, adhere to, except when I'm talking about Arthur France. <laughs> um, so the book, so the book has a sort of, um, there's a sort of, it's a sort of eulogy, but to try and defend my academic reputation, it also tries to talk about the, the world that has formed Arthur. So there's a long section on St. Kitts and Nevis, which I'm only going to allude to. And I'm actually quite proud of, that's an appendix. It's a history of St. Kitts and Nevis. And I'm quite proud of that because it was surprisingly hard to get the material to produce a history of St. Kitts and Nevis. And it, that's a slightly more academic Arthur, that's not you phoning me, is it? So let me just, let me just turn this off. Um, um, sorry about that. So, so the the um, the history of St Kitts and Nevis is is a slightly slightly more academic. And somebody said it's too academic for this kind of book. Put it in as an appendix. People here would enjoy the history. Of um, but the other thing that uh, makes it slightly different from some some books that you read is that I do try and use Arthur's story as a way of talking about the history of what used to be called in sociology race relations in Britain in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and early 80s. I don't take it right up to date, but it does have a kind of a wider context. But I'm now going to just concentrate on Arthur's life 
via some slides, which I was going to be able to control off a little gizmo, which is here. I think I can control off this. So sorry, the, the footage, the layout has slipped a bit. I write these in an Apple program and it's converted to a PowerPoint and it's, it slips slightly. So that is one part of the title of the book. And this isn't going to let me advance. Alan, could you just press the side one? Alan? Yeah, I'm trying. To... Oh, okay. It's just the, yeah, it's that one. Yeah. Oh, no, that's the last one. <laughs> so, so just because since you've seen that, I'm not going to be too pernickety about dates on this, but there is a sort of like an appendix with, with all the dates in. Okay, so that's the one there. Right, so that, okay, the slides have got slightly jumbled. So just, these, these are just, oh, and they've now disappeared altogether. Can, you, can we go back, just try, try doing the reverse? It, the, the first slide has a picture of Arthur at the big, at the big breakfast. Yeah, there, hold it there. So, because I am mad about photos, these aren't my photos, but they do give you just a little vignette of Arthur's life. Here he is with his wife and, and children on the big breakfast show. So there has been some genuine recognition of Arthur, but the book says, as those of you who know this kind of hidden from history thing, the book says that people like Arthur in general are hidden from history. Mm -hmm. Arthur has had some recognition and I will refer to that. So there he is on the big breakfast and most of you will recognize his mate here in the lower one. That is the great Muhammad Ali. So through, in fact, the publisher of this book is Hansib, which is a marvelous British public of Guyanese heritage, but they're Brits who produced a company called Hansib, which for a while had a lot of very good uh, newspapers, Caribbean Times, African Times, Asian Times, and that's disappeared. And there he met through Hansib, he met the great Muhammad Ali. But what most people don't know is he used to drive a motorbike. And there's a great bit in the book where he describes racing white Leeds motorbike fanatics who had much bigger motorbikes than he did, who won this man. There's a little red light on it. Let's see if it does. It does. So there are St. Kitts and Nevis. And those of you who know the Caribbean know that, you know, that the islands are not, there are one or two larger islands, Trinidad and Tobago and so on, and Jamaica are over there, but, but the islands are small. St. Kitts and Nevis are tiny. Anybody been to St. Kitts? Any, anybody? I, know you, I thought you might say that. <laughs> anybody else been to St. Kitts and Nevis? Yeah. I think we'd all agree they're small, right? Uh, Chapel Town is quite big compared with St. Kitts and Nevis, kind of, you know, like there's 35,000 people on St. Kitts and about 12,000 on Nevis. I mean, these are very small places. And I only mention that because A, there's a joke among Caribbeans, oh, they're only from small islands, uh, which is not a terribly good joke and it's not made so much, but Jamaicans might say that because they think that these people from, from little villages on small islands are somehow less than them. So it's sort of not a terribly great joke. But the thing that is important about saying that is that it is extraordinary when you see the achievements of people who've come from absolutely tiny places. Part of the British Empire, which I will say a little bit more about in a minute, but they're tiny little places. It's extraordinary that people who've come from such small places have achieved so, so, such great things. Obviously, you've got to say something about this abomination, the triangular trade. And the book does say quite a bit in the appendix, particularly uh, about this, and I'm not gonna go on about it, but you cannot clearly talk about Arthur's achievements without acknowledging the abomination of the enslavement of millions of Africans from the mid 1600s onwards. And that is the context in which Arthur's forebears arrive in these little tiny islands and, as I'll say in a minute, 
you know, contribute to the sugar trade. From Nevis with Love, I just want to put that there. That's on the wall in in um, in, in in Arthur's house. It's a you know a memento of Nevis, and I just want to mention the love. I've already spoken of love, but I want to mention the love in the context of a of a lifetime of very very serious political struggle against white racism and it is a, another tribute to Arthur that he's done that throughout his life with love in his heart so it's not it's not a small thing to say from Nevis with love that love that has been brought to this country sits alongside some pretty serious political struggle can we get that can we, can I sit down here? So again, just to sort of rub that in a bit there, 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 that's only 1900. So that's only 120 years ago. That is the life of Arthur's, Arthur's forebears. We tried uh, with some help from the archivists in, in um, St. Kitts. I tried to see if I could find a, a deeper history of people called France. And they turn up in the archives, you know, the birth records only in about the mid 1800s. There are people called France who are in the sort of slave trade records, um, but it's not at all clear exactly which bits of, 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 of whether they're Arthur's Francis or whether the people just acquired names through their slave, the, the, their owners or what. But that is that is the kind of, you know, that is the, the I think I've put it somewhere, imperialism's other gold mine. That is sugar. Nevis was actually the most profitable island in the whole Caribbean until about 1800, something like this, it began to become less profitable because they don't, it's a volcano is Nevis. So it was incredibly fertile, incredibly profitable. And I give the, I give the numbers here and, you know, it's eye watering the money that the Europeans in general made out of slavery and the Brits made, made even more out of this, out of this, this traffic in enslaved peoples. So that's the that's just to rub that in. There's a uh, you can't really tell the um, size of it there, but Arthur's birthplace is up is about there. So the next slide, please. The other thing to just mention by way of sort of introduction is that you can't understand Arthur outside what he calls the the the, the clan, and his. Uh, in fact, as I met him just now, he said to me, Ebenezer would be cross. And Ebenezer is his dad, who is the most punctilious timekeeper that you've ever come across. And luckily, we just about came in under Ebenezer's very strict rules about keeping exactly to time. So I'm sorry we're about three minutes late by the time we arrived. But it wasn't, it was just we got a mix up about where we were meeting. But this is Arthur's siblings. And and the Queen Mother, his 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 his, his mum, <coughs> that's your mum there, Arthur, isn't it there? Yeah, and and is it your mum standing? Yeah. Oh, okay, yes, of course, standing on the left there, there. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, we haven't a picture of his dad in the book. I put a picture of the of the vehicle that uh, his dad drove around Nevis because he managed the estate of one of the white colonial estate owners. And for managing the estate, he also drove the, this gentleman around in a very lovely um, uh, a wool, a, ox, an Austin, Austin, wool is it? Austin of England. An Austin of England. And there's a photo in homage to the dad, who we haven't got a photo, there's a photo of the car. And Arthur does speak as a child of being rather proud to be able to drive around the tiny island in this car. Next slide, please. We're not going to move on. There we go. So this is Mount Lily. Uh, that's the kind of accommodation you have there now. This is the, the old accommodation that's still there. Uh, these are key moments as well. This is teacher Francis, who um, Arthur, as, as you will probably know, and it, it is very significant to, the, to this migration story, African people had an English education in the colonies, in the, in the, in the English colonies. And teacher Francis uh, was very formative in giving Arthur a good basic education as a youngster in school. And I had the privilege of meeting him. And he, he, he says one or two rather caustic remarks about Arthur in the book. He's, 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 he's very clear-sighted, this teacher Francis. And he, 
I don't think, I don't even believe this, but I put it in and Arthur has read the book and hasn't objected, so I will repeat it. He says that Arthur was, Arthur had all these sisters, you saw them in the previous thing, and they all rather sort of dominated him. I can't quite believe that they did, but that's what teacher Prazzi said. And, and um, but uh, he was terribly pleased that Arthur's achieved such great things in this country. And that's his lovely wife. And Arthur is a, a hero in, in, in Nevis and St. Kitts. So whenever he does go back, the local schools invite him in and he gives a talk and they have a presentation for him. So those are photos I took in how long ago? 206, I'm not that old, 201, 2016 that should be, sorry. Uh, so next slide, if we can get there. Yeah, so this is the, um, I'm, I'm sorry to rush this, but I, I've got another few slides and I want to give you time, time to speak with Arthur as well. So there's a, there's a chapter in the book called Black Power, and I'm only just touching on this because the book does tell you, and again, quite hard to research this actually, it just shows how partial British historians have been that apart from a fantastic PhD at the University of Sheffield, there is no really proper account of the Black Power movement in Britain that began in the 1960s and was extremely influential across the whole of Britain in the 60s, 70s and early 80s. And Arthur is a founder of that movement and ma massively respected among the old guard of the people who, who, who were participants and are still alive. Um, one of whom, unfortunately, is no longer alive, who I'll mention in, in a minute, called Darkest Howe. But Arthur is a sort of pioneer in all sorts of respects, which is that he founded the United Caribbean Association in this house in uh, November 1964. And the significance of that is, and this is, Arthur describes in the book that they remained as the United Caribbean Association. They didn't call themselves the Black Panthers or the Leeds Black Panthers or, or, the, or, or the various other names of the various parts of the Black Power movement. They always called themselves the United Caribbean Association. And there are two reasons for this. One is that they channeled a very, very important and unfortunately unsuccessful effort in the, just as the Caribbean islands were gaining independence, several of them said we're so small we need a federation and they set up the west indies federation which was a, a, a joint body of pretty well all of those islands as arthur said they wouldn't let guyana join because guyana had a marxist government at that point so they they kept guyana at, at, at arm's length unfortunately but the federation did exist as an effort to do what do you remember the European Union? You know that idea that you are better together? And the West Indies saw that very powerfully in the 1950s, set up the Federation. As I say, it didn't survive, but Arthur was intent that when they arrived in Chapeltown, met largely initially, but obviously in other parts of Leeds as well, they would have an organization which united the Caribbean islands. And so uh, everybody from any island was a member that wanted to be was a member of the UCA. So that was a that was a a, a, a very pioneering uh, intervention, and and as you'll see in a minute, was very instrumental in various kinds of change. But the but the other but the other um, significance of calling yourselves the UCA rather than giving yourself a, a a kind of black power kind of moniker was that it meant that they could always embody black power without acquiring all the opprobrium. If you remember, the older people in the room will remember just how bonkers the British press went when various black power organizations announced themselves and announced their forthright opposition to white racism in a way that the UCA always embodied, but had a much more, um, I hate to use a word like moderate because they weren't moderate, but they had a much more, um, I suppose, strategic and tactically wise approach to these issues. So there's the mention of the, of the Federation. So thanks, Alan, for the next slide. And I'm just picking up a couple of things only really here. Um, now, some of you will know Tom Steele, um, another major historian of all kinds of things in Leeds. And Tom found this for me, 
when I was when I said I was doing this book. And there's a nice account from Tom of this, uh, what was called a colour bar. It, you know, a, 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 it was a, a, a pub. Some of you will remember it, the Ford Green on Round A Road, great big, huge 30s, 30s pub. And it operated a colour bar. And I'm not sure, I don't think Arthur was actually in this particular protest, but um, it was organized in, the, the UCA knew about it because UCA people were there, but it was organized by somebody who also needs a little book writing about her, which meant, who, who many of you know, a woman called Maureen Baker. Nod if you remember Maureen Baker, if you know Maureen Baker. So Maureen was a kind of an extraordinarily effective political organizer on all things to do with race and racism and became a very big friend of Arthur's and, and was actually one of the few, she and Paul, were actually members of the United Caribbean Association. And I can, I can remember, I can remember that Maureen was Irish heritage, white. Paul was Eastern European heritage, Jewish. But I think that's why they had such solidarity with, with the new migrants, the, the Caribbean migrants and the Asian migrants. And I can remember Maureen saying, in public meetings, we black people are fed up with this. And I'm thinking, uh, but nobody, no, none of the black people ever said, uh, Maureen, you know, nobody, everybody said, yeah, because she was completely one of the party of militant people fighting against racism alongside and within the UCA. And this is a particular um, protest in this case that they organized, that Arthur and his team organized against, as you will know, leads. Uh, as a whole regarded Chapel Town as a sort of an other, in my book about Chapel Town, I call it sort of, it was actually called the colony within in, in the Yorkshire Post at one point, this idea that this place called Chapel Town, they imagined to be entirely black, which of course statistically, demographically it wasn't, and they imagined it to be entirely full of pimps, prostitutes, criminals, drug dealers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It was a totally, totally false representation of what was actually a multicultural and vibrant and law-abiding area but one of the one of the blights was that prostitutes worked on the streets and the UC the UCA had this demo which you can see is full of young militant young women and and obviously there were lots of lots of men but that's just two of the main of, of, of the important things that the UCA did next one thank you So the other sort of thematic of this of this talk is Arthur's commitment to education. And in keeping with every migrant that I've ever met from any part of the world, whenever you, I ask people, was it worth it? And I had a moving conversation with a Bangladeshi man when I used to work at the law center on this, who was living in abject poverty in the middle of Chapel Town. And and poverty that I've never seen anything of the likes of in all the white families that I used to visit as a law center worker. And I did visit people in poverty. The Bangladeshi guy was in, it was just a bare house. And I said to him, was it worth it? And all he said, he said, yes. And then he pointed over there and he pointed to a school, a Bankside Primary School, actually, some of you will know. And, and he said, yes. He didn't have a huge amount of English. He said, yes, school. And he pointed to his small children in the, in the room. And of course, every migrant knows that if you are going to get anywhere in this country, it's because you do as much as you possibly can within not a, always a totally favorably disposed schooling system. And Arthur and the UCA were absolutely committed right from the start to the children getting a decent education and to to make that happen they were one of the pioneers in this country of setting up the saturday supplementary school in 1971 and george archibald is arthur's quite funny about this because if you knew arthur in the 70s you would think this guy i was terrified of him this guy is um a very powerful very dramatic very militant person. It turns out that George used to say to Arthur, George would be sort of behind Arthur saying, just just a little bit slower, just a little bit quieter, just no don't say that. <laughs> so uh, George is a little bit older. Interestingly enough, George was in the British military. 
So much as his politics had developed in a completely anti-colonial way, George, George apparently had a, a, a sort of, perhaps a slightly more tactical sense of how to get things done than uh, the young Arthur ever did. So there's the young Arthur, there's George, and these of course are all grown up and very successful uh, Caribbean people in, Le in, in Leeds and, uh, and across, the, across the country. Um, that photo is taken by Dave Williams, who you're going to hear about in a minute uh, when we talk about Chapel Town News. Next slide, thank you. And the book tells you quite a lot about this, actually. So here's Race Today, uh, edited at this point by somebody who was a big friend and comrade of, of, of uh, Arthur's, but unfortunately has passed away in, uh, seven or eight years ago, Darkus Howe. Some of you will have seen him on TV, became very successful as a, as a TV presenter. Um, in the 90s, and they took over this uh, magazine called Race Today. And this, if you ever, like people like me who are desperately trying to catch up with what was happening in Britain, this was sort of the way in which you found out about, as I said before, race relations nationally and internationally. And they were very keen on explaining what was happening in British schools and the protests about, them, about British schools. And here, before you see that's February 1974, in June 1973, you probably can't uh, read that, Arthur and his people in the UCA actually called the first, and as far as I know, only strike by black children and black parents in a British school. And that is described in some detail. I can't remember if the next slide says a bit more, I think it does. We can get, yeah. So, so this is, this is a joke at my expense. I just started to help the Chapel Town News and the person, the journalist who wrote it and produced really quite a presentable thing, just said, I'm stopping this, Max, you do it now. And I, I'd never done a line of Letraset. Did you all remember Letraset? Remember you all used Letraset? I, I did have a manual typewriter and I knew you put a, black rib, a, a proper black ribbon in. Uh, I didn't know you used a set square. I didn't, I, anyway, so it looks raggedy because this is done by a complete novice. But what we did do is write in quite important detail of precisely what the parents were demanding and precisely what, you know, what had to happen if they were going to bring the kids back to school. They'd, they'd been negotiating this for a year. They'd been objecting to the standards at Carver Street School for a year through all the normal channels, all the proper channels, and eventually said enough's enough. They had a strike and within about a week of the strike, their demands were met, which included the sacking of the headmaster. How did the British sack somebody who is an absolute disgrace? They promote him. But nevertheless, he left the school and a much better, not perfect, but a much better um, series of heads and teaching resources came in. And that's the Race Today article I was saying to Alan before I took that photo, or I took the photo and sent the, the, the strip of negs to Race Today and never saw them again. So hence, I haven't got a proper set of, of photos for this. You'll see I'm standing back because I'm nervous. I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the organizing committee. I'm just trying to make sure that it gets properly recorded, but I, I, I'm, I'm nervous in these days. So let's go forward. I'm almost through. I mentioned Dave Williams before. Dave is there. He helped us with Chapel Down News. He had done Leeds Other Paper, which some of you will remember, the original Leeds Other Paper. In fact, Richard here is an old pal of David's, of, of Dave Williams's. Dave luckily came in after about issue four of Chapel Town News and taught me how to use a set square and how to do letter sets straight. Dave was a man of many parts and was my boss at Jacob Cramer College, where he, was, I, he employed me to teach. I use inverted commas, teach <coughs> apprentices general studies. Um, and then in the early 80s, Dave got the job of uh, director of Tech North because Dave had known Arthur, he'd taken the photos of Chapel Town News, he'd been around Carnival, Dave lived in Chapel Town and was aware right from the start that Tech North as a training centre predominantly aimed at as a second chance centre really with a particular remit for young people of, of African and Asian origin who hadn't done so well at school, Dave realized that you had to have a multicultural staff. 
and 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 those those are those are some of the stuff. And unfortunately, Arthur's not in that photo. But in about I think about eighty two, Arthur is taken on to do general education at Tech North, which he did until until he retired. And the book does give you one or two examples, um, some of which are not standard educational practice, namely taking boys by the scruff of the neck and saying, work harder, like his dad took him by the scruff of the neck and said, work harder. And these boys did do very well. It was called tough love, I think, is the sort of the best way of describing it. But Arthur was a big, uh, and people still will stop him. And sometimes white parents will, because it took white kids as well, white parents will stop him and say, thank you for doing all the great work you did with my son at Tech North back in the 80s and 90s. So that's the team at Tech North, and that is another of Arthur's contributions to changing education in, in, in Leeds, well, in, in Britain, really, because it lines up with the Black Power movement in schools. Thank you for the next one. Uh, we could go back. So the uh, other, and I can't emphasize enough, I think in, I have a little intro slide which says changing, uh, culture, changing, changing politics in Leeds, changing education in Leeds and changing culture in Leeds. And I can't emphasize enough how extraordinary it is that Arthur had the vision for a carnival in Leeds in 1966. And we have a friendly rivalry, rivalry with Notting Hill, which we always win by saying, and this is the historical truth, this is the first Caribbean carnival in Europe. Notting Hill by the 70s becomes a Caribbean carnival, but in the 60s, those of you who might have even experienced it, it was a multicultural, no, no, no worse for being a multicultural carnival. It wasn't black led, it did have black uh, contributions, but it was, a, and it was a deliberate effort to make Notting Hill a more harmonious multicultural uh, neighborhood in Leeds. But it's Arthur's vision to have one that, a carnival that's in, that follows the Caribbean development of what everybody knows is, you know, has a history in Europe, but becomes a very distinctive cultural formation in initially Trinidad and then spreads across the, across the Caribbean as a whole. Mm -hmm. So the first carnival takes place in 1967. That's not my photo. Um, this is my photo of the carnival committee. Um, this got made into a postcard and my son, our son started to sort of send it to people. And they said, why are you sending us a photo of an American soul band? And, and he said, it's not, it's the Charlestown Carnival Committee in 1974, as it clearly says on the back, but they do look like they could be very successful on the stage. And this is actually Mel B's auntie. So that, there are loads of ways of thinking about carnival and I write about it in the slack, the other guys, but what I'm emphasizing here is an extraordinary learning experience in popular in, in, in popular art in, in every respect, in costume making, in performance, in telling stories, in a, in a dramatic public space. Um, it's, you know, it's an extraordinary phenomenon. Arthur is so dedicated to it that the, here is Mahalia, now Councillor Mahalia France. Here's Mahalia dragged into carnival in her dad's arms in, that is, I think, Oh, it says there what the date is. I think it's 76. Um, so there's Arthur in costume. And then and there's another couple of pictures about carnival and then I'm done. Yeah. As I say, there are lots of ways of talking about carnival. One, one that I'm picking on here is Celebrate Africa because you can see that that has been written into the costume there. And Arthur will always say I'm an African first, and he will always remind everybody that for all the European elements in Carnival, without the African element in Carnival, it wouldn't be what it is imported really from West Africa by the enslaved peoples. And when, when, when they finally get some freedom in Trinidad, they inject this African form of Carnival, in, in some cases in a riotous way, this famous Cambolet riots of, I think, about 1867 in, in Trinidad had carnival, had carnival banned for many years in Trinidad. As the African, the formerly enslaved and now formerly free Africans 
take a bigger and bigger part in carnival and use the kind of liminal space that it provides to push back up power in some cases in in quite quite violent ways in other cases in a more culturally um, critical kind of satirical form um, so celebrate africa is is part of it but i'm also celebrating willie robinson here who's a trinidadian who is um, arthur's left hand and right hand man in especially in the first days of carnival and he and his wife have performed in carnival since they went to nottingham i think sometime in the 70s um, but have always come back and so here's willie helping in arthur's mass camp in 2016. here's a photo of arthur's troop in 1998 that i took and you'll see then again so ahead of the game recognizing that by 1998 it's 50 years since windrush let's think about that previous 50 years and let's do something in carnival which encourages all the bystanders and all the participants because arthur will always talk about the meaning of the event of the costumes he's making and why they have a significance and they always have a particular message attached to them and on this occasion we're we're, we're celebrating the windrush generation i won't even start on the scandal initiated by theresa may and you all read about in recent years as they try and expel these people all of whom of course come here as british citizens and are entitled to the rights of all british citizens which they have to fight to implement as time goes by so that's another um element of carnival but this is probably my favorite this is arthur um, <laughs> dressed as diane abbott because you will remember in 1987 four black Labour MPs appear in Parliament. And this was actually quite a big moment for those of us who were desperate to see proper recognition and, and full progress for the Caribbean, the Windrush generation, and, and or the parents of the Windrush generation. And Diane Abbott becomes one of our first MPs. And of course, you know, I don't know why, because celebrities will come to the Leeds Carnival and they will make speeches, but mm -hmm. Arthur does something much better and much funnier and much more long lasting, which is to dress up as Diane Abbott mm -hmm. and indicate that that says Diane Abbott on the poll tax, because Diane Abbott quite rightly was at the front of the campaigns against the poll tax, because Diane Abbott quite rightly sees herself as part of Britain and intervening in British politics as a whole, not just black politics. Anyway, Arthur looks very comely, I think you will agree. And I'm not quite sure what's happened to his uh, his, 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 addition, his additions there, but it worked very well on stage. He made me once, for my sins, play Prince Charles at Diana's wedding. I had to play Prince Charles. We used to do these kind of sketches on stage with a political message. It was extremely embarrassing, but not as embarrassing as the time when somebody else made me play William Wilberforce who, as you know, did not abolish slavery. The enslaved peoples abolished slavery and not to be too Marxist about it, economics abolished slavery, but to play, to play Prince Charles and Lord Wilberforce were probably two of the most humiliating moments in my Chapel Town life, but everybody laughed, so it was okay. And I think that might be the end. Um, so there are some key dates for 1935, but I just want to mention so, so the, that, that's, John, that's Arthur's working life. Could we just go to the next one? Because I just want to mention, I said at the beginning, that he has had, rightfully, a lot of public recognition. So Leeds University gives him an honorary doctorate in 2017. I'm pretty fed up that Leeds Beckett waited till 2018 because I proposed him in 2015, I think, and it took them three years to get around to doing it, but at least they did eventually give him an honorary doctorate. Um, the, these are, you know, these are the these are the voluntary work. Could we go back to the previous slide because he's got? Oh my God! Go to the next slide. The formatting is sorry. The formatting is slipped. But he has, as as it said at the beginning, he's had an MBE, and um, you know he has. I don't know. Yeah, the MBEs. The date is in the in the slides of the MBE. So there has, a, you know, it is a sign of some of the progress over the many years that Arthur's been here, that some recognition has been awarded to Arthur for his uh, achievements. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll think, if you do read the book, that we do him some justice 
um, in the book as well. And that's it from me, but there's 15 minutes for Q&A and obviously Arpa is here and, and is now gonna take over really. So thank you for your attention. Thank you to the Thorosby Society for inviting me. And um, thank you all those people, all those people at home. Thank you Ian for doing the tech. Thanks for the Leeds Library, isn't this a great venue? Um, and we're very pleased to be in the Leeds Library as well. So thanks everybody.